afternoon. Good afternoon. The time is now 12.55 p.m. and a quorum of the board is present. State Board of Education regular meeting of August 9, 2022 is called to order. Uh, Marilyn, are there individuals who wish to address the board during today's meeting? Yes, there are people who have registered to provide public comment to people in person and there are people um, virtually that will join us to provide public comment. I'll review the rules for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the board and I will keep track of time. We will be strictly enforcing the time limits so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. It is the practice of the board not to respond to comments during the public participation portion of the meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people and disrespecting anyone by name or otherwise will be asked to cease. Um, so if we can have the first two people prepare, the first speaker is Sherry Ritchie and she will be followed by Bree Mogenberg. So if you will come to the table, let me computer out of your way. Sure. And we're ready whenever you're ready to start. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sherry Ritchie. I've been here before. I'm from Lansing. I live nearby. Um, today, I am uh, got to put my eyeballs on. Today, I'm expressing my grave concern regarding mature adult sexual content being made available to minors in school without parental knowledge or consent. The reason for being and purpose of the public schools is to teach fundamentals of concrete skill sets for functioning in life and contributing to society. It is not their job to provide personal and private carnal knowledge that is completely inappropriate for teenagers. To everything there is a season, and age 14 to 18 is not the season to be supplying these kinds of reading materials. And even if you personally think and believe that it's okay for these ages, it's not okay within the walls of our public schools. I'm going to read some excerpts from a book titled What Girls Are Made Of, author Elena Elena K. Arnold. This is going to be difficult and embarrassing for me, and that it's being rep recorded for public record is kind of mortifying. But I'm standing for what's right. I'm here to do what's right. And this is not right. First excerpt from What Girls Are Made Of by Elena K. Arnold, part one, page 21. The scene is a 16-year-old girl has an appointment at Planned Parenthood because she had unprotected sex. After the door closes behind her, I consider placing the still folded paper gown on the exam table and just getting the hell out of there. I personally don't swear either, so sorry. But then I picture Seth's brown eyes, the way they look up at me from between my thighs and I stay. Page 32. My legs were shaking, so I sat down on the edge of his bed, and my legs fell open to make room for his mouth. He licked and licked like a cat at a bowl of cream, and when the inside of me felt as wet as the outside, we tried again. Page 35. It's the way he looks just after he's come, his face softened and sweeter than normal, it's the way his fingers look glazed like a donut after they have been inside of me. It's everything. He is everything. Page 75. I pull him out of his underwear and he's soft in my hand. I don't look up at his face before I open my mouth and pull him into it. And pull and I suck until he grows hard and he makes sounds that mean he likes it. And I keep going and going when he says, I'm going to come. I don't pull away. The jet of him is warm and salty and tastes like thickened sweat. He breathes hard and his hands are tight fists. I'm sorry. That concludes your time. Thank you. Thank you. So Ray sorry. Morgenberg is so next. Sorry. Good afternoon. Bree Morgenberg from Mount Pleasant. Today, I'm here on behalf of Moms for Liberty of Isabella County. I'm going to present to you a resolution in regards to the concerns with sexuality and gender education and promotion in Michigan public schools. So I want to be clear, this resolution is not about advancing specific ideologies, creeds, or religions. 
It is certainly seeming at some times with the state of Michigan and just as the excerpt that you heard from the book that certain families are being disrespected and inhibited and children are actually being punished if their parents opt them out of such instruction. We have seen these issues arise and I think it's fair to say that we're all actually probably really exhausted of this division and of these conversations. So if you've all received one of these resolutions, if you actually look down to paragraph nine, um, I want to let you know there's a lot you can read, but this is actually a very American resolution and this honors constitution and it honors Michigan law as well as school policies that you'll see within this packet. Be it therefore resolved, sexuality and gender instruction, discussion, and promotion be reserved solely for content in sexual education class, which requires parental permission and no consequences to the child for opting out of such a class. And in such a case, where it must be inserted into a different course, parents must opt their child in to the instruction, discussion, or promotion without consequence for lack of participation and with alternative courses with a different path offered. So what this means is it is understood there are many different ideologies and beliefs, but those are all different. And in order to be inclusive to all Americans and to all of those, we need to make sure that parents are aware and they have an opportunity to opt their children out. Now in our community, recently there were three men that were arrested in a child sting operation. One of those worked at the public school. And a year ago, working at the public school where my child was, he stood up on the podium and he spoke about his sexuality and what community he was. And he continued to call me names for standing up for my child who had received zero for participation points after she came home crying because we opted her out of discussion about sexuality and gender. Sexuality is about one's sexual attraction and that can't be removed from what it is and many children are also going to see that that way. It is a very deep, deep, deep personal concept and ideology and that's something that should take place in the family and if families aren't ready with their children to be ready, the family should be able to opt their child out or opt their child in and teachers make that known. I ask at this time that you review the information in this packet and that you allow me an opportunity for discussion on it. And if you have any questions, it can be added to the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will move to virtual um, public comment. Mike, if you would admit the first speaker, please. People will be admitted one at a time. When you are admitted, if you will please turn down the YouTube feed that you may have going in the background, that would be helpful. I will keep a three minute timer. Is the first caller there? <coughs> may I please have Hello? Your, hi, may I, may I please have your name and where you're calling from and then please provide your three minutes of comments. All right. Sorry, one second, I wasn't ready for you. My name is Tessa Jansma, calling from Wyoming, Michigan. Continue, and please. Can I just go for it? You sure can. All right. Thank you. Well, yeah, I am calling about these books we have in our schools. Um, I have contested two books, which committees have chose to keep. I will follow suit here and read one for you. This is Crank by Ellen Hopkins. <clears throat> he did terrible things. I've got the scars. Things no sane per person should ever do. Kisses to do to bite. Bruises. Off came my shorts. Down went his zipper. Brendan paused, savoring my terror. He had done it different. He had done it a different way. I may have responded with excitement. Instead, I froze as he pushed inside. I laid there sobbing as he worked and sweated over me. Soaked by the monster, it took him a long time to finish. He pulled away, sticky and bloody. If I had known you were going to just lay there, it wouldn't have bothered the rapist told his victim on the car ride home. Told my mother, fuck you. Talk about your strange bedfellows. I was in line for the menage of trolls. My boss almost caught me last time. Think I could convince her to try a line 
I'd love to get her in bed, Adam said. Don't blame you there, man. She's a babe. For someone my mom's age, I'd do her too. Think she'd go for a, a threesome, Lance said. Whoa, baby, keep it in your pants, at least till I take it out of them. Anyway, three's a crowd. I decided there's a thong. There's a throng. Four is more. We used to do coke till just say no, put that stuff out of reach. Now it's crank, mess, the monster. It's a bitch on the body, but flies, you fly. These are the kind of books that we have in our schools right now and that us parents are challenging and the so-called committees that they put together, they're keeping these books in our schools. <clears throat> now, this is a nationwide agenda. We see you. You are on notice. This will end. We will read you books all day long. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Next caller, please. Get out of them. Anyway, there's a crowd. I if you could please turn down the YouTube in the background and then give me your name, where you're calling from, and provide your comments, that'd be great. My name is Stephanie Boone. I'm calling from Ada, Michigan. I represent thousands of concerned parents in West Michigan. Continue, please. Okay. Um, I am calling in um, just to provide some comments about um, uh, my experience with some of the inappropriate books and content within our libraries. Um, our media specialist at Lowell Schools was overwhelmed last fall, so I told, told her that I would help out by giving a call to the Overdrive Company. That is the company that our schools pay to help um, create the digital online collections and libraries. Um, our local schools in Kent County use Destiny and Sora systems for the uh, students to have access to the online library. On three separate occasions last fall, I called and spoke with a representative from Overdrive who ended up hanging up on me each of the three times I called because she wanted nothing to do with fixing the issue about students having access to materials that parents are not okay with. Um, one that is still currently available in at least five school districts in Michigan does contain explicit sexual activities and sexual nudity. It's called The V Word. It's written by Amber Kaiser. And I will read a little bit from page 12. Except soon it's 9.26 p.m., according to the clock on my nightstand. He's still 16, and his parents expect him home by 10. Then as he's putting his flannel back on, even though he needs to get home, I kiss him again, reach down to feel if he's hard. He's always hard. I think that's magical. I push his flannel off his shoulders, wrench his t-shirt off, kneel down between his knees. We don't say anything. We pull his jeans down around his ankles. He's in his striped boxers again. His white tube socks pulled up his calves in that dorky boy way. I don't look up, so I don't know if he's watching or just feeling what I'm doing. We pull down his boxers, and a second later, I feel him in my mouth. Under my palms, his thighs are trembling. But what I'm doing is solid and clear, honest. I hear the sound of him sucking in his breath. Sweet, salty, sour, bitter, the way his body tenses. The way he breathes, soft, then hard. It's perfect. It feels like something I'm creating. When he comes, which is just a few minutes into it, I swallow it all. The sweet, salty, sour, bitter. This is unacceptable, and parents have a right to have a say in what their children are exposed to in school. Please do something about this. Thank you. Thank you for calling. May I please have your name, where you're calling from, and then if you can provide your three minutes of comments, that would be great. Hello, um, my name is Kylie Zink. I am calling from Dundee, Michigan. Continue. All right. Um, hello. Um, I am also speaking today over concern um, over some of the literature that's found in our kids' schools. Um, there's so many books featuring sexually explicit content and alcohol and drug abuse. Um, today, I'm going to read a few snippets from the book called Triangles, written by 
Ellen Hopkins. Um, this book is readily available in the libraries of several schools. There's too many to name throughout Michigan. Um, it's about three separate women with different relationship statuses that discover themselves while having sexual relationships with mutual acquaintances. Um, it features very graphic, obscene sexual content, alcohol, drug abuse, profanity, um, many other things. So um, please enjoy these uh, few snippets that I have for you. Um, on page 40, his fingers snake into my hair, pull my face into his, and when his mouth covers mine, rum and mint flavor his tongue. The kiss I return is not gentle, and when his body rocks against mine, he is hard against the throb, growing faster, faster between my legs. He is strong. My heart pounds as he wraps my right leg around his hips. Lift. Beneath my short denim skirt, he finds nothing but skin and hot, wet pulsing. His fingers start there, work their way inside. My body screams for orgasm, but not like that. Fuck me, I beg. His eyes, feral, meet mine. He smiles, props me up on his knee, unzips his fine silk trousers, brings the swollen knob of his cock against my thrumming slit. Stop. Say please. She keeps, uh, page 57, she keeps blasting away at something on screen. Wait, are you shooting? Not kids? Don't worry, says Chad. They're not American kids. They're Muslims. Um, page 248. Big voice. Check this spread. Deep voice. You talking food or pussy? Squeaky voice. Make me a drink, baby. Taunting voice. You can drink this, darling. Um, on page 308, um, this one is long. To offer up ever slender thread of control is frightening, exhilarating. I am naked when he lays me, trembling on the bed. I won't hurt you, not if you're very good. He uses my stockings, one for my hands, which he crosses at the wrist, stretching them over my head. The other he wraps around my eyes. I'm swimming in a dark sea where something unseen waits for me. Don't move. It's hard to comply when his teeth rake my neck in a vampire-style kiss lower to my nipples. His bite is half brilliant, hurt, half surreal pleasure. The scent lifting from his hair is spice. Clothes, I think. <clears throat> Open your leg. His face dives between them. And his mouth claims what he finds there. Thank you. Your and time says, is up. Thank you. Thank you for calling. If you can please give me your name, where you're calling from, and begin your three minutes of comments. Thanks. Yes. Um, my name is Tammy Gombar from Rockford. Um, my comments are, um, I'm concerned about the books in our schools. Um, we are not um, asking for books to be banned. We are simply asking that sexually explicit materials be removed from schools. We are asking that just like any other movies, DVDs, songs, books, and are inappropriate for minors not to be accessible in minors um, in their school libraries. I'm in support of the resolution concerning sexuality and gender education in Michigan public schools. I apologize for what um, I'm about to read, but here goes. Um, I'm, I'm going to start by introducing you to a book that's currently in my school district where my eight-year-old son used to attend. Um, I have pulled um, him because of the content found in the school um, and the conversations I personally had um, with his speech teacher when he was eight years old and I was actually in a summer class with him. I was told by her personally that she had open conversations with her fifth and sixth grade IEP um, grades, fifth and grade IEP students about gay sex. These, these are her words, not mine. Um, said, and she said these conversations happen all the time with her students and it was completely normal. This is not normal coming from a parent of an eight year old child at the time. I was completely offended as a parent. Um, I spoke with the superintendent of the school at the time, Dr. Um, Michael Scheibler. Um, he has since retired and the head of the IEP, Mindy Duba, for over two hours each. No response from either one of them. And the next school board meeting that I attended to talk about these particular books, um, the teacher was hired for a full-time um, position for the next school year, along with 40 other plus woke instructors to replace all of teachers leaving in growth. Um, the book I will be reading is currently in my, in my son's school district, along with many of other inappropriate books for children. It's titled The Fun Home. The author is Allison Belchett. It's B-E-C-H-D-E-N. 
L, how it's described or whatever is the book summary. It's an adult graphic novel. This is in children's schools. The book summary is a young woman discovers her homosexuality while seeking a, um, a rational uh, rational for her father's sudden death deemed as suicide. Um, summary of concerns. This book contains alternate alternate sexuality alternate gender ideology, profanity, alcohol use, suicide, um, commentary, inflammatory religious commentary, sexual activities, and sexual nudity. Um, the co- there's a huge contact warning. says you, you were about to access materials that may, cont- or may contain content of an adult nature. These files may um, include pictures of materials that some viewers may find offensive. If you are under the age of 18 or such materials offend you or it is illegal for you to view these materials, please exit now. That is right on the front of the book in regards to be able to do this. And these are in children's schools. Not cool. It's from coming from a parent. Here are some of the experts in the actual um, thing as regards to starting on page 17. Um, but would an idly... Idle husband and father have sex with teenage boys. Page seventeen, page forty-four. The illustration. Thank you for on calling. Your time is, is up. Six or seven. Thank, thank you. I didn't even get to what I was supposed to. Thank you for calling. Depict the illustration on the top of the page. Depict the dead man naked. Ma'am, your time is up. Kaylee, I didn't even get to read the book. The illustration on the top Ma'am, of the page thank you for calling. Your time is up. There are many people that would also like three minutes of opportunity. View, thank you. The illustration of the middle left side of the... Mike, may I please have the next caller? Thank you for calling. Hello, may I please have your name, where you're calling from, and your three minutes of comments? Hello, my name is Kimberly Wilkins from Dundee, Michigan. Yes, please provide your comments. Thanks for calling. I'm here today to read the book, Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J. Mott. I found this book in my child's school, Dundee High School in Dundee, Michigan. I have concerns with books of this nature being available to children as young as 13. <clears throat> this book contains explicit sexual contact content. I have no desire to ban books, but I am asking the Michigan Board of Education to remove all sexually explicit material from our children's schools. The Court of Mist and Fury even contains a content warning, quote, you are about to access material that may contain content of an adult nature. If you are under the age of 18, if you're, yeah, a 14 year old can check this book out at their school library with no question that. <clears throat> On page 45, his tongue swept my mouth again in time to the finger that he slipped inside of me. My hips undulated, demanding more, craving the fullness of him. And his growl <coughs> reverberated in my chest as he added another finger. I moved on him. Lightning lashed through my veins and my focus narrowed to his fingers, his mouth, his body on mine. His palm pushed against the bundle of nerves at the apex on my thighs, and I groaned his name as I shattered. He stretched out above me, his head lowering to my breast, and it, and all it took was one press of his teeth against my nipple before I was clawing at his back, before I hooked my legs around him, and he settled between them. This, I needed this. His paws, arms trembling as he held himself over me. We were fused, two hearts beating as one, and I promised myself it always would be that way as they pulled out a few inches. The muscles of his back flexing beneath my hands and then slammed back into me again and again. When I grasped his name, his own release found him. I gripped him through each shuddered wave, savoring the weight of him, the feel of his skin, of his strength. Page 314, she pressed a kiss to the hollow of my throat. 
you are much a monster as me. She curved the knife over my breast, angling it towards me, peaked nipple as is she could see the heart beating beneath. Page 693. I wonder when his hands beneath my breast and between my legs. What Thank Ryan's you for calling. Your time is up. Thank you. Please remove these books from our school. Caller, if you can please mute the background YouTube and give me your name and where you're calling from. Thanks for calling. Hello, my name is Jamie McElvaney from Let Them Play, Michigan. I planned on being there in person for my public comment while holding up posters of the graphics in these books, but I couldn't find a printing company to print them for me because of the pornographic content. Go figure. It's also funny that I'm now banned on my, for the second time on Facebook for posting adult nudity and sexual content from the books that are in your schools. Isn't it funny that the most liberal-leaning organization in the country, Facebook, finds these books to be inappropriate while people are fighting to keep these books in your schools? I first want to say that I am in support of the resolution set forth that this resolution is a start in bringing both sides together with some common sense solutions. I personally do not see that there are two sides to this battle. The fact that some people are fighting to keep these sexually explicit books in school libraries is mind boggling to me. Why are these people so obsessed with teaching explicit sexual content to minors? Who allows these books to be in the schools in the first place? You have to be a pretty sick person to read these books and then say, hmm, I think these would be great to put on the shelves for 13, 14, and 15-year-olds. These books are sexually explicit, and some are straight-up pornographic. They should be removed from the school system. However, this is not banning them. They would still be available at the local library for any parent who has a deep desire to read sexually explicit books with their children. I want the people fighting to keep these books in schools to hear with their own ears exactly what they're fighting for. Book number one, Pushed by Sapphire. This is a story about a seven-year-old little girl being raped continuously by her mother and father. My daddy stinks. The white shit drips off his dick. I lick it. I hate that. But then I feel the hot cha-cha feeling when he's inside me. A girl having her father's dick in her mouth knows things that other girls don't know. I'm choking between my mother's legs. She smells like big woman smell. She says, lick it, precious. Suck it. Her hand is like a mountain pushing my head down. My hand is going through the smell of mama. My hand is pushing daddy's dick out of my face. Mama pushes my head down in her. I gag from the smell. Daddy pops my pussy in and out, and I come. He bites me hard. I shiver. He orgasms in me. His body is shaking. My pussy is popping like grease in a frying pan. His dick is soft. He starts sucking my titty. I hate it. Afterwards, I go to the bathroom and smear shit on my face. Book number two, All Boys Aren't Blue, is a story about the older cousin raping his younger cousin. You told me to take off my pants, which I did. Then you took off yours. You stood in front of me fully erect and said, taste it. This is what boys like us do. You reached your hand down, pulled out my dick. You quickly went to giving me head. I just sat back and enjoyed it as I could tell you were too. We both got up and went into the bedroom completely naked. The only thing I knew about anal sex previously was that it was painful. Nervous and drunk, I listened and got on my stomach. You got on top of me and inserted yourself into me. It was the worst pain I'd ever felt, but then you added lube, so we tried again. Identical. This is a book about a daddy raping his little seven-year-old girl. Kaylee was roused at his words, secure in the aura of daddy's love. She tried to sit up, but daddy pushed her gently back down against the mattress. Just stay like that for daddy. I want to teach you something new. He lifted her nightgown, rolled it up over her belly, coaxed her thoroughbred legs apart. She squirmed in protest. Don't move, daddy said. Don't be afraid. This won't hurt you. You'll like it, I promise. He kissed the length of her torso down to the small naked V. Book number four, Lucky, a story about violent rape. He came Your in me, got up off up. the ground. Thank you for calling. Hi, caller. May I have your name and where you're calling from in your three minutes of comments? Thank you. My name is Daniela Cantos. I'm supporting the resolution of the DEI. I want my parental rights and the safety of my child to be upheld per law and per God's law. I am a Catholic and don't want my child to be learning any of this, and this is trying to be passed and want children to have opt-in by parental consent and not have my child be discriminated in education or socially because we have religious beliefs. My child should also not lose any credit in school nor being in these type of teachings. 
just listened to some of these books being read, and I'm absolutely disgusted. How are you guys even wanting these books in schools? You guys should all be arrested. Are they in schools? This is absolutely disgusting for children to read. Talking about a rape with her father? In the detail? How is that acceptable? In any way, shape, or form. This needs to be banned, and it needs to be banned now. You guys need to uphold our Constitution of protecting children. These are children, and you guys are trying to act like this is no big deal. This is a huge deal. This is disgusting filth that comes from Satan, and it needs to stop. So that's what I need to say. Thank you for calling. May I please have your name, where you're calling from, and your three minutes of comments? Hello? Is there anyone there? <coughs> Caller, may I please have your name, where you're calling from, and your three minutes of comments? Hi, my name is Dr. Linda Lee Tarver. I'm calling from Lansing, Michigan. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Please continue. Sure. I'm calling regarding the uh, pornography or what is perceived to be pornography by parents in our public school system today. And we must do better. We must have better, and we must ensure that since pornography laws are somehow suspended for um, educational institutions, we still have pornography laws in Michigan that must be adhered to. So we need to ensure that Section 380.10, which is the parental rights law here in Michigan, must be in the favor of the parents and not of the um, progressive or um, teachers who perceive that what is acceptable in their home will be acceptable in a child's home. So this is an important issue, but even more importantly, there's a proposal dealing with abortion that the State Board of Education needs to deal with that allows for schools to facilitate an abortion for a child without the parent's permission or consent or knowledge. And that must be dealt with. I suggest that the State Board of Education issue a resolution that it will not be done and should not be done. Thank you. Thank you for calling. If you can please turn down the YouTube in the back and give me your name, where you're calling from, and provide your three minutes of comments, that would be great. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can. Hi, uh, my name is Renee Jasinski, and I am calling from Wyandotte, Michigan. Um, I'm calling, I have two high schoolers, a ninth and uh, 11th grader, and I just wanted to say I have contested three pornographic books in um, my city of Wyandotte, and the Wyandotte School Board put together a review committee who voted to keep all three books in the library. I also wanted to comment um, and to voice my support regarding the sexuality and gender resolution that the Gail from Moms for Liberty presented to you today. I have read the resolution and believe that this is an important topic. I'm kindly asking to please add this resolution to your agenda for discussion. I like that uh, this opting in resolution will allow parents to review what material their child will be learning prior to signing the consent to either opt in or out. Parents will appreciate making an informed decision for what is best for their child. Adding this resolution to your agenda will show parents that you are at least willing to have a discussion and take into consideration concerns and ideas brought forward by the community. Thank you very much for your time. 
Thank you for calling. Presented to you today. If you can please turn down the YouTube feed in the back and give me your name and where you're calling from and provide your three minutes of comments, that would be great. Hi, my name is Jamie Martinez. I'm calling from Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And I would just like to say that schools should be, and in the much further past, have been a safe place for our children, a place they felt safe, but also a place that we as parents felt safe to send them, knowing that teachers and parents work together for the best interests of our children, with the parent always able to take the lead. And however, that's not the case anymore, as is evident in some of these books that um, I have heard being read here today. I'm a 44-year-old woman, and um, I, I'm sickened by the, the content of the books that I don't even believe you would find at a public libra library in the, the children's or teenage section. It would be in the appropriate section of an adult, but yet we have it in our school. Anyhow, um, I believe schools have overstepped in their role and position of educating our children especially but not solely on the topic of sexuality and gender identity. I have done some subbing in our high school and was very surprised to walk into a classroom that had pride flags being displayed and on the wall and many sayings that were in regards to the same topic of gender identity plastered on the walls as well, an influence that I believe is uncalled for, not to mention if we proudly displayed a Bible, the Ten Commandments, or any verses that reference um, God's view on those things, it would be considered uh, hateful and not tolerated. Um, if we were to display any heterosexual comments, it would also come across as not inclusive and hateful. The ground is not level, and there is a clear agenda being pushed. Schools are no longer a safe place where parents and teachers work together for the betterment of their children. So I respectfully ask you to review the resolution presented by the Moms for Liberty, Isabella County chapter concerning sexuality and gender education and promotion in our Michigan public schools. I strongly believe that it is a step in the right direction for parents to once again take the lead in working with our schools for our children to once again make our schools a safe place to send our kids, which I believe we could all agree is what we want. Thank you for your time and your consideration today. Thank you for calling. May I please have your name and where you're calling from in your three minutes of comments? Uh, hi, thanks for letting me speak today. My name is Caitlin Flowers. I'm calling from Vesterberg, Michigan. I have three children who used to be in the public school system, but Due to the Board of Education's disregard and disrespect for parents, I chose to homeschool my children. I've been homeschooling them the past few years with the hope that parents and schools would come together and work together again. I read this resolution put forth by Moms for Liberty, and I found it very fair and logical. Um, and I believe it would go a long way to bridge the divide between the government education system and parents. And I think that anyone who reads this resolution in full would come to that same conclusion. Um, I would also like to thank Nikki Snyder and Tom McMillan for their continued support and genuine consideration to us parents and our children. Thank you. Thank you for calling. I have done some studying in our high school. Caller, if you could please mute time. the background yeah. feed yeah. and then yeah. give me your name and where you're yeah. calling yeah. from and you yeah. provide your three minutes of comments. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cynthia Weeblehouse. I'm calling from Taylor, Michigan. And I just wanted to let you know that I 100% support this resolution that was put before you. Um, I'm very familiar with some of these books um, that are absolutely disgusting that have been put in the library. There has to be some kind of a firewall put in place between libraries and children that have access uh, to um, 
electronic libraries, through their um, tablets, etc. We have to put something in place to protect our children. Um, I just think it's absolutely horrific that we are going against our own Michigan Constitution when it comes to teaching children these types of things and um, the conversations that are taking place within the school um, with some of these teachers. Many of these people that have been hired in as teachers are not even um, accredited. So um, that is my statement. Um, I please hope you take it to heart, and I pray for each and every one of you that the good Lord would remove the scales from your eyes so that you can see what's really going on here. Um, our future is at stake, and you are part of our future. And um, I would just pray that each of you um, would pray and uh, reconsider where you are allowing our schools to go. I thank you so much. Have thank a you for calling. Day. Good afternoon, caller. May I please have your name and where you're calling from, and you can provide your three minutes of comments. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, my name is Maria. I'm calling from Oakland County. Each of you in this room are responsible for the leadership and general supervision of all public education in Michigan. And listening to what you are supporting, allowing, and or promoting in our school libraries is truly disturbing and disgusting. It's your job to advocate for our children. The hard facts are your actions are failing Michigan students, and it's time the board starts focusing on improving the academic performance across all grades instead of spending your time and efforts promoting SEL, CRT ideologies, DEI, sex education, gender ID, advocating for sexually explicit materials in libraries, masking our children in vaccines. Your job is to lead and supervise education, and that's it. How does spending your time focusing on liberal political ideologies improve the academic performance of Michigan students? The simple answer is it doesn't. The 2021 state assessments indicate that only 24% of Michigan students in grades 3 through 8 are proficient in English and writing. Is it okay that 1 in 4 students are proficient? Does it demonstrate the effectiveness of your actions? And math is even more abysmal with only 21% proficiency in those grades. And in grades five and six, there was only 16% proficiency. This is not only embarrassing, but detrimental to Michigan students and families. Michigan public schools have lost over 70,000 students in the last past few years. And earlier this morning, it was mentioned that retaining enrollment may be a part of demonstrating parent satisfaction. Well, clearly thousands of parents are not satisfied if 70,000 students have left this public school system. Maybe you as a group need to start discussing the hard facts and outcomes of your work. Maybe not promoting the suffocation of children with masks would have kept some of those students. Maybe not pushing sexual identity and transgenderism ideologies to young children would have kept some of those students. Maybe not infusing racism with SEL and CRT into the minds of young children would have kept those students. And certainly, considering the library books that you're, you're discussing today, maybe some of those students would have been kept if they were not there. You as a board need to start accepting the damaging outcomes you've created when you, and we want to know when you're going to fix it. Several board members push political agendas over education in every single meeting, and it needs to stop. This is not a political forum for your personal views. This is about our children. Do I need to remind you that we, the parents, are your customers? In fact, that was mentioned this morning in the meeting. Perhaps you should start surveying the very customers that make public comment every single month that, that you guys continue to ignore. Perhaps the board should do some customer satisfaction surveys. Many of us would love to show you how dissatisfied we are and what we feel is important in schools, which is academics, not your political agendas. It was also mentioned today that parents choose what school to send their children to. Really? What about all of us that have children on IEPs or don't have financial means for other sort of school options? Did you ever consider how many of us there are out there? There's a lot. I'll leave you with one perspective. The board spent so much time talking on gender ID and transgender and things like that in school when transgender only makes up 3% of the national population. And you spend more time on that than Thank the 75% of the students that up. are illiterate in Thank our school. Thank you. So do something about it. Thank you. You guys continue to ignore. If you can please mute the feed in the background, caller, give me your name and yeah. where you're calling from and provide your three minutes of comments. Thanks for calling in. 
Yes, hello. My name is Shannon Seco. I live in Wyandotte, Michigan, uh, the Wayne County District. I am calling to uh, support the resolution concerning sexuality and gender education and promotion in Michigan public schools. Some of these materials that we're coming across, um, we've been researching, and they are inappropriate for our children. They can be affected um, and exposed exposure to the graphic sexual materials that are known to damage the brain de- development and lead to premature sexual activity and high <laughs> rates of depression, anxiety, and teen pregnancy, and also um, STDs. Um, our children are our future. Us parents, we're the real stakeholders, and we entrust the schools to help us fulfill their, res- their responsibility and educate and protect uh, the children. The schools must adopt common sense policy solutions that don't do not threaten the privacy and safety and dignity of all children and all the students. I su- very much support this resolution and I hope that all of you are listening to all the parents that are calling in. We all just want one thing, safety for our children. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Caller, if you could please mute the feed in the background and then give me your name. Just one second, I will. And and Um, then please give me your name and where you're calling from and provide your three minutes of comments. Thanks for calling in. Okay. Okay, Rutherford, um, I'm going to read out of a book. Um, from the titles of what some people are doing I'm so- to cover up I'm sorry one. to interrupt you. I didn't catch your name and where you're calling from. From Rockford. And your name? Um, Tom. Um, title um, of the actual thing, the one of the books I'm just going to read on, it's called The Fun Home. And these are some of the experts, excerpts from the actual book. Page 58, I am a lesbian. My homosexuality remains at this point purely ma'am, theoretical. Ma'am, and un- ma'am, yeah? I believe we've already spoken with you, Ms. Gomber. You've already had your three minutes today. Am no? I correct about that, Ms. Gomber? You're not. You're not. Same telephone number that was registered. Yes, I'm talking for a friend. I'm actually at the same house thing. I'm t- it's different. Can I please read? There is the same house. What's your name, please? It is Tanya. Tanya? Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Can I read? Continue. Can I read? Continue, okay. please. Um, okay. I am a lesbian. My homosexuality remains at the point purely <laughs> theoretical and unattested hypo- hypo- um, hypothesis. Your father had affairs with other men. He was molested by a farmhand when he was young. Page 59. Why had I told them I had ever had sex with anyone yet? Conversely, my father had been having sex with men for years and not telling anyone. Page 77. My father called after receiving it. He seemed strangely pleased to think I was having some kind of orgy. Everyone should experiment. It's healthy. Page 80. Feminism is the theory. Lesbian is, lesbianism is the practice. The l- illustration on the top right side of the page depicts two nude women in bed. They both have blankets pulled up to their waist. One woman is sitting up on her elbow with, the, with her left breast exposed. The text above image reading, um, and by midterm, I had been sed- seduced completely. The illustration in the middle of the page um, depicted two sets of legs intertwined on the bed with books strewn about them. The text above image reads, Joan was a poet and a mar- Marcus. Um, I spent um, very little um, little of the remaining semester outside her bed. The illustration on the bottom left inside of the page depicts two nude women laying on their stomachs with one woman on top of the other. The woman on top has her tongue and the other woman's ear and she's reading from a book. The text above image reads, I lost my bearings. The dic- dictionary um, had become erotic. The woman on the um, bottom read, Oh, his mouth oral, oscillated, ocular, basically descriptive, gross. <laughs> the illustrations on the bottom right of the side book depicted the same individual described above lying on their backs and their beds. One of the women is reading, um, reading the text above. Some of her favorite childhood stories were revealed propaganda. The woman's reading the book says, God's 
um, Christopher Robin is totally imperialist. The illustrations on the top of the page depicted the same individuals describing above. One of the women laying on her back in the Your bed. Your time's up. Thank you for calling. Woman. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Is there a caller on the line? Yes, I'm here. Hi, may I please have your name, where you're calling from, and your three minutes of comments? Holly from Monroe County. Jack of Hearts, L.C. Rosen. This is a book that's available in over 13 high schools, probably a lot more than that, in the state of Michigan. Now, before this, I'd sucked my share of dicks and gotten plenty of blowjobs, hand jobs, every kind of job, but the only butt sex I'd had sex with is a junior who was in love with my cock and he just hopped aboard and he'd taken control then total bossy bottom i pretty much just laid back and enjoyed so as far as i knew anal was pretty easy like porn easy anyway here's my advice to you make sure you want to do it because it's going to be uncomfortable at first for sure but it can be fun too even if you don't have a prostate there are nerve endings and pressure just make sure you've taken a shit beforehand and cleaned after preferably with soap and water in the shower because if you got to go while he's inside you, it's going to come out gross. When you're ready to get fucked, use lots of lube. A finger first. Go slow. Make sure he's still focused on keeping you turned on, too. It helps if you start out riding him facing forward. Then you have more control over how deep he goes. And you can still communicate what you need. Once he's in you, tell him to just stay there for a while so you can get used to it. Then when you give the okay, he can slowly start fucking you. If you don't like it, tell him to stop. If you decide to switch holes, use a fresh condom. And be prepared. Sometimes shit just happens. But if you take it slow, it can be really great. That's available for our high school students in over 13 different schools throughout the state of Michigan. Personal politics aside, this should be the one thing that all of us could find some kind of common ground on. We aren't asking for these books to be banned. We're not asking them for it to be burned. They can still access them at public libraries, Amazon, Borders, etc. We are asking for you to take inappropriate content out of our school libraries, content that we censor every day if it's in a movie or a song. Even YouTube has age-appropriate warnings and safeguards in place. We are demanding this content be removed from schools as it is inappropriate for most students and unnecessary for any student to be successful. I am in support of the resolution concerning sexuality and gender education in Michigan public schools, and I cannot imagine any reasonable explanation why any of you sitting at that table would not be in favor of it as well. You are the State Board of Education. Districts across the state are struggling with declining enrollment, and that will also lead to teacher layoffs. Show all of us teachers, all of us parents and board members across the state that you're willing to find common ground and do what you can to help curb the exodus of students from the public school system within the state of Michigan. You need to ban all this inappropriate material immediately. Thank you for calling. Mike, have we heard? Okay. Another caller? May I please have your name, where you're calling from, and your three minutes of comments? And if you've got a feed going in the background, can you please uh, mute that? Thanks. Hi, my name is Stacy from Monroe County. I'm a parent, nurse, and precinct delegate. I'm just going to get right into um, reading a book called Trick by Ellen Hopkins. Page 235, another of Iris's badass plays. One I can't forget. I do my best never to think of him, what he did. Try never to remember that place in my childhood, but sometimes it pops into view despite all my efforts to keep it hidden. I was almost 10. I was worked at a cat house, making money her usual way. Only without walking the street, wait, was a minor. And though he was a regular paying customer at Mimi's, he had an appetite for younger meat. Iris was younger than two, but even at 26, she was way too old for what? Wait, still, he paid for her. I remember how he touched Iris and how he didn't care that her kids could see. I remember his marble breath falling all down around me when he said, let me show you something. On another day, it wouldn't have happened. Couldn't have happened. Too many witnesses around. 
But for some odd reason, that particular afternoon, Iris had taken the other kids to play in the park. But it wasn't more than 10 minutes before Walt came home the, through the door. He didn't ask where Iris was or why the house was so quiet. He didn't say one word. I opened a can of refried beans, spooned them into a pot. I had no real reason to be afraid, so why did my hands shake? I kept my back to him, but could feel his eyes carving into me. Finally, he started toward the living room. Bring me a beer, sweet. He wasn't on the couch, as expected. Back here, he called from Iris's room. He was already out of his jeans. I didn't know much then, but I knew there was something very wrong about that. He grabbed my hand, struck me hard against him. Let me show you something. I tried to run, but he was faster. Tried to fight. He was stronger. Tried to scream. He choked my, my cries. When he finished, thank God it didn't take long, he rolled off me with a grunt. Reached for his beer, slammed it, ripped out, ripped in pride, swallowed up by the shame of what that meant. I crawled into the bathroom to scrub away the evidence. Not when he followed me, stood in the doorway, watching me, finally said, tell a soul I'll do your sister too. I knew he would come back for Marianne. She was only eight. If he did this to her, she would die for sure. It had almost killed me. Page 323. Get the fuck away from me. The guy is right behind me, beer breath, hat on my neck. Iris didn't lie. You really are a knockout. His arms wrap around me, and his rough hands go straight to my boobs. I try to knock them away, but I'm no match for his strength. You like it rough, because I'm just the guy to give it that way. No extra charge. The words burn into my ear. What? What the fuck did you say? A sudden burst of will pushes him back away. I turn to face him. He advances, a thin line of spit leaking from his mouth to his chin. I stare at evil. I said, no, extra charge. I already paid $200 for a good time with you. Might as well make it very good. He's on me, yanking Thank my Thank you hair. for calling. Your time is up. Hi, caller. If you can please give me your name, where you're calling from, and provide your three minutes of comments. Good afternoon. My name is Billy Schultz. I am from Southgate. I am here asking for this board to support the resolution censoring sexuality and gender education and promotion in Michigan public schools. If R-rated and X-rated movies are not allowed in the schools, why are X-rated and R-rated books allowed? If we are not asked, we are not asking to ban the porn, but to remove these sexual materials that our minor children should not have access to in a public school. If a parent wants their children to have this type of materials, they can go to Barnes and Noble or Amazon to purchase them for their minors themselves. The book that I am going to describe to you today is called Brave New World. This is a graphic novel that just shows pictures. And the summary of concerns, this book contains controversial religious commentary, sexual activities, sexual nudity, drug use, self-harm, including suicide. On page six, you can find an illustration on the bottom of the page that describes a full body view of a nude man standing on a cliff with his arms outstretched. On page 17, there is an illustration on the bottom right side of the book that shows a baby diapered butt tox, de diapered butt tox and profile viewing being electrocuted. On page 54, the illustration in the middle of the page shows a hologram of a nude couple from a profile view. On page 68, an illustration on this page shows a holographic couple in a foreground looking 
at each other, the words across the woman read, hug me till you drug me. These materials do not belong in our schools. Another book called Tricks. Page nine, why would God need a pecker anyway? Page 33, swollen with desire, demanding, let's still lock to mine, she mumbled, moaned, what if I give you this? Her hand found my own. In the heat of the moment, I got hard, especially when Janet touched me, dropped onto her knees, lowered my zipper, started to do what I never suspected she would do, how to do. Yes. Page 59. Thank you for calling. Your time is up. Mike, have all the people who have previously registered received an opportunity to comment and if, if they've been on the phone line? Yes, they have. Thank you for your help. Thank you, Mike. Thank you to all those who provided public comment today. The next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is the presentation of the Early Childhood Standards of Quality for Birth to Kindergarten. In alignment with Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan, these standards strive to support the growth and development of all children birth to kindergarten to support early childhood professionals in recognizing individual developmental trajectories and expressions of learning to guide programs toward the highest quality in their operations. Pending board approval, this set of standards will replace Michigan's current early childhood standards of quality for infant and toddler programs and early childhood standards of quality for pre-kindergarten, both of which were adopted in 2013. We welcome our presenters, Dr. Scott Kennigschneck, Deputy Superintendent, Division of P20 System and Student Transitions, and Mr. Richard Lauer, Director of the Office of Preschool and Out-of-School Time Learning. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. It may, in fact, be a, a test. This presentation will be followed by a period of public comment and a request for board approval during the November State Board of Education meeting. Presenters, welcome. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rice. <clears throat> Thank you, board, for allowing us to spend some time with you this afternoon presenting uh, a revised set of early childhood standards of quality for birth to kindergarten. Um, so the standards that we're going to share this, uh, this afternoon are nearly 10 years old, which was one of the reasons for the need for the update. Uh, early childhood has changed quite a bit over the last nine years. And so I'm joined by Mr. L Richard Lauer. Richard um, led the process to update the standards. He's going to share with you a, a tremendous amount of information this afternoon, uh, including the process used, um, the stakeholders that were involved, and then finally um, present the standards uh, as revised. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Lauer. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Appreciate your time. So this uh, revision work that we um, started in about February of last year has been done in service to the goals <clears throat> of the top 10 strategic education plan that you passed uh, now several years ago. Goals one, two, and three in particular of the top 10 strategic education plan. I want to make note though that while the early childhood standards of quality were last revised in 2013, they were built upon a strong foundation that the state board has set of preceding standards that date back to the pre-primary objectives approved by the State Board of Education, the Michigan State Board of Education, back in 1971. Um, that's a pretty impressive um, history of this board's leadership for Michigan and across the country. And through the work that we've undertaken, we have built upon them again. Perspectives on the world around us have changed. Research has revealed new information, as Dr. Kenestek has indicated. Key state and national organizations have released new work and standards of their own. And we have taken care to consider all of those pieces of information as we updated these guidelines that are specific to what Michigan's programs and children need to support our early childhood settings and reaching even higher quality 
than they are currently at. The project uh, that we undertook, Michigan stakeholders have developed a comprehensive set of early childhood learning and program standards. Um, we all received an electronic a copy of them. You know, it's quite hefty, as you see in front of you, 138 pages of early learning and program standards that do reflect the current research and understanding of what's best for young children in our state and from birth to kindergarten. The purpose of these standards is to support the growth and development of all children throughout the state, birth to kindergarten, to support early childhood professionals in recognizing individual developmental trajectories and expressions of learning, and to guide programs toward the highest quality in their operations. And how will these standards be used? The standards will guide, as I said, early childhood educators and caregivers' expectations, instructional strategies and learning environments, as well as their communication with families. The standards will be used as a coaching tool and for professional learning as well. Each goal includes examples of children's observable behaviors and instructional practices and examples of program quality standards in action. Each goal also includes self-reflection questions <clears throat> to aid early childhood professionals in their settings and in improving and refining their practices while supporting program improvement. In addition, these standards will help guide and inform the development of early childhood development programs at institutes of higher education as they're developing their teacher certification programs as well as their bachelor programs in early childhood and early childhood development and teaching. This is an overview of where these proposed standards are at this point in time prior to public comment. On the left, you see the uh, domains of the early learning and development standards themselves. These are akin to what you're uh, used to for the Michigan K-12 standards related to the learning objectives that the students have. These are appropriate for the young children, zero to five. So on the left are the individual outcome areas of learning for the children that are comprehensive. On the right-hand side, you see program quality standards. These are standards related to the environment in which the children learn. So who participated in this update? As I indicated, this process started in uh, roughly February, March of, of uh, last year. Stakeholders were recruited through, from throughout Michigan, and we began with a list of stakeholders recommended by current MD staff based on their work with those individuals. Then we began recruiting beyond and thinking about additional stakeholders and through our external partners based on those people's recommendations, based on perspective, not individual. Perspectives are important to ensure that we uh, have a robust, um, well-rounded group of individuals. In particular, uh, in this way, we're able to collect a broad group, as I indicated, of individuals of a variety of perspectives and expertise to assist us. These are standards of the field and of Michigan. So what you'll see on here in particular, and because these are zero to five, we have on here parents and family advocates. I know I didn't put these in the greatest order, but I'll acknowledge that as an error on my part. Parents and family advocates are, are probably the most important individuals on this group. But of course, researchers and faculty from educator, educator prep institutions, we need that research base, those who helped us under, acquire that information. Um, to stay up to date from two and four year uh, institutions. Of course, practitioners and administrators, we wanted to have their perspectives. Um, and then because we want all children to be included and not uh, in an embedded way, of course, experts from the fields of special education, multilingual learners, and, um, you know, as well. I'll leave it at that. Um, ISD consultants. Many of our early childhood programs throughout Michigan right now run through intermediate school districts. Given that, we wanted to ensure that ISD consultants were part of this work as well. 
And you'll see, even though we do not um, directly run Head Start or Early Head Start, it's a federal program to local. We ensured that many of our partners were part of this work as well. And we did include cross office representation across the department because we do believe in our um, P20 collaboration across our, 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 our wonderful Department of Education. How we broke up this team is that we had 30 writers actually work on these standards. And then we had 43 reviewers actually reflect upon that writing work of the group. The stakeholder committee being divided into these two subcommittees um, was a structure we've used before on the birth decay um, teacher certification standards, on the pre-K-3 teacher certification standards. It's worked well for us. Um, that was in partnership, obviously, with the Office of Educator Excellence. Through this structure, the project ensured participatory decision making among the writing group members and detailed feedback from the uh, valuable and unique perspectives of the review panelists. Within the scope of the review and the revision project, the writers reflected on the national trends, the examples from other states, and agreed to combine the previously separate standards, which I can show you right here. If you recall these uh, back in 2013, some of you may, others may not. But we had two separate sets of standards. One's for infant toddler, one for pre-K. The group uh, agreed that we needed to showcase a continuum of learning across zero to five across those uh, domains. And so they agreed to combine the previously separated standards for a single aligned set of standards following the progression of growth, learning and development from birth to kindergarten. Each section of the draft document was shared with an external review team for feedback. The responses were compiled reviewed by the writing team and revisions were made um, in several rounds before obviously the final draft document was is here presented to you today. Again, for visual uh, representation, here are the early childhood standards of quality for birth to kindergarten. Um, previously, two separate sets of standards. So what have we accomplished in this uh, one set of combined standards from a continuum. Um, embedded supports for multilingual children have been uh, provided in this continuum, uh, represented in this continuum. Children with individual needs also attended to throughout the zero to five continuum. And children from a full range of backgrounds and experiences as well. This is a fully inclusive set of standards for all children uh, birth through kindergarten. These are uh, just a quick snapshot of how you can think about the updates. We've combined the two previous sets of standards. There's been some reordering of the previous set of standards into this new uh, holistic comprehensive set. Revisions have been made and clarifications. Also, these standards that you see before you have been, are, have been aligned, as I've mentioned a couple times, with a few other sets of standards. Um, those for teaching prep, teachers prep, as well as those with licensing for child care centers and homes. In particular, what we did with these uh, standards is that we excised guidelines that were already covered by other standards. No point to duplicate. Um, avoid, it avoids uh, redundancies, it avoids confusion, and it extends the lifespan of this document. In particular, uh, this document has emphasized, the writing group has emphasized children's development, uh, developing understanding of technology and the arts as tools and methods for accomplishing goals such as problem solving, communication, and self-expression. The social, emotional, and physical health and development section of the previous, previous um, standards have been broken into do two different sections. Uh, so that is to note, this division uh, included updates in both sections to align with current research on the importance of physical and mental health, social skills, and self-regulation 
to promote success in school and in life. There's been substantial uh, revisions in the language and early literacy development section to align with the current research on how children learn to communicate, read, and write from birth to kindergarten as well. This section is now communication, language, and literacy within the proposed standards document. What this new document also will include beyond the actual standards themselves are additional supports. And this will be our first time wonder, and we have, uh, because we have um, resources to provide additional supports for implementation of these standards um, once we are able to get an approved version um, in the future. So we have proposed additional supports. Uh, and we had the writers prepare them um, in, with an expectation. At some point, they could be implemented. The writers have delineated a set of supports within the, to be placed within the standards in a final published version that include observable behaviors. Currently, you have those within the standards that you have seen. That the observable behaviors demonstrate the goals and emerging indicators of the standards. Those were the child may dot, 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 examples that you saw in the standards. But what um, the additional uh, supports that you will see here are strategy and, strategies and materials uh, that will be included in the, uh, in the learning environment to support development of the goals and indicators. These are meant to help the uh, early childhood provider understand how to actually implement the standards as well as self-reflection prompts, an additional support material to aid caregiving adults in ensuring their own practice is aligned with the standards as well. And then for the program quality side of the standards, an in-action aspect of supports, similar to the examples of instructional strategies, but for teachers and caregivers related to the program standards. So at this point, our next steps after today's presentation and any Q and A is uh, is that we would release this for public comment and hold it open for at least thirty days through September twenty first. We will compile a review with the writing team the um, public comment, produce the public comment document for you obviously, and come back in November with a final presentation and recommendation for you to approve. Um, professional learning and other supports to follow upon um, a final presentation. And that professional learning and other supports would, is going to include an online professional learning module being created um, that showcases an overview of the change from prior standards to current um, tip sheets, additional supports that were mentioned on the previous slide, and going uh, being able to present that as a first round or a first phase of professional supports for the field. And that would be posted to the uh, Office of Great Starts My Registry Professional Learning System. You have my email and you know who I am if you have any additional questions after today. I, that concludes my presentation, Dr. X. We know who you are. We know where to find you. <laughs> yes, you do. <clears throat> Mr. Lauer, Dr. Kenny Schneck, board members, uh, questions or comments? Uh, Mr. McMillan. So these are standards. Um, there's not going to be any kind of um, standardized tests, I take it. Uh, so what if uh, people think this stuff is bunk and don't want to do it? That's okay? There are certain programs that are funded that need to adhere to these standards. Like, how would you know? I mean, um, you're if not they're tested, right? Excuse me. You're not going to test it, right? I mean, how would you know if your programs align with these standards? Yeah. Um, the standards are a foundational document that between the program standards and the early learning and development standards. There are child assessments that align to these domains that you saw on the left-hand side of the document. I can go back to that slide. On the left-hand side, <clears throat> not all of them in 100%, but 
related to math, science, social studies, uh, physical health and development, social emotional development, creative arts, communication, early literacy. Um, there are tools that do assess young children across domains um, in early childhood. Many programs do utilize those as screeners to be able to assess children, whether or not they're on track developmentally, just like in pediatricians' offices. As Self I mean, who does that assessment, an outside party or the mm -hmm. teacher? Um, often the teacher. For the, I, shouldn't, I mean, these are two-year-olds, I don't know. These are zero to the, five. The, right, the, so child, the provider. Provider is going to self-assess whether they're following the standards or not. And then related to the standards, uh, the program itself. So many in the home visiting, like the zero to two, zero to three area, um, the standards themselves would be related to if it's a publicly funded program. So if it's a private program, that is an area that it is completely voluntary. If it's a publicly funded program, typically there would be in some grant assurances that they would um, attend to the standards to the best of their ability while they're getting professional development to grow in quality, which means in our words, growing in quality means continue to align with the standards to the best of their ability. Okay, all these people on the review committee and the writing committee, they all agreed to everyone, everything in here? Then no, there no, was, no dissensions, no concerns, nothing, and none of them? Correct. The, Did they sign a document saying that? There's a consensus model to all the content that is presented. They signed it? Each, each individual person signed that they agree to it all? There's nobody to hold and accountable. I mean, to okay. On page, I mean, so for five year olds that they should choose math over art, I mean, I don't know. I'd like to know who, if every one of those people agree with that, they, they feel that art isn't something that at a, for a five year old should care more about or that they need to, you know, choose a math activity over an art activity or I, I don't know. Um, there's just a lot of there's a lot of things in here that I can't imagine. Um, you know, they could cite scientifically. Um, you know, that every four year old needs to climb the rock wall on a play structure. You know, are, is every single person saying that they agree that that's what a four year old should be able to do? And if they can't, there's a problem, and they should have funding withheld if, and or if a program doesn't want to doesn't want to have you know have that as their standard. There would be no <clears throat> funding without some four-year-olds can't climb a rock wall. Correct. Children with disabilities in particular, there may be a child who can't climb a rock wall. It's a standard. It's a, 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 a suggestion that. Well, that's, but I mean, is it a suggestion? I thought they have to adhere to these or else, you know, but if they want to get funding. Richard had said to the best of their ability. To the best of their ability. So it, it, it drives a quality um, expectation as set by research in the, in, in the early childhood field industry that you continue to strive toward. There are many paths that, you know, go on to the, the road of quality. And so many different providers can enter on that path of quality at a different, um, at a different you know, point. And so we allow for that. Not everyone's going to be at the top. Uh, of that point of quality, we allow for many different individuals, uh, providers, to be able to come on to the path and then work toward a greater level of quality. Um, the other piece of the early childhood developmental standards is that many in the early childhood um, pro of the programs, for what they're implementing is a comprehensive approach to child development. And so they're not implementing a math or art or science. It is not a an or situation. It is a integrated approach to learning. So they're learning math and science and engineering at the same time along with 
uh, physical development. It is, so when engaging in an activity is not a singular domain of learning, it is a multi-domain of learning. And then so on page uh, 20, 20 okay. it says four-year-olds should be able to tell someone they're mean or doing something upsetting. I mean, there's an kids, example. There's some kids that might, that might be uncomfortable for them and you're going to, yeah, the standard is to push them to, to do that or to get them to do that or, you know, I mean, is that, are we sure, is every single person that reviewed and wrote this saying that that is appropriate? I mean, I guess there's no vote. There was no signing a document that they agreed to it. I guess I just. So the the actual indicate uh, that the standard around is self-regulation. Children develop an increasing ability to manage their emotions and behaviors. I can say with confidence that all of the uh, writers and reviewers would support that 100%. They do believe that a, a young child, zero to five, should be able to work toward increasing their ability to manage their emotions and behaviors. When you look and you're fo focusing on a four-year-old uh, at that point, and the example provided of a child may tell someone that they're being a, uh, are being mean to do something that is upsetting to them, that's an example of how they may outwardly um, display that they are functioning in that way. They may also say, um, tell someone that what you're doing makes me sad. That's another way of conveying that same thing. The main thing is that they're managing their emotions in a proper way and they're conveying it. That's the goal. I'll just end. I remember going to a union hall with, I believe, uh, President Obrich and maybe uh, Michelle and hearing kindergarten teachers say that they are doing all kinds of observations and testing. And it, yep. they said it was overwhelming. They couldn't actually get to the, their classroom stuff because, oh, yeah. and they complained about how it's, you know, a problem. And so I don't know, they're the ones doing these observations? No, uh, I believe what you're referring yeah. to is the Michigan Kindergarten Entry Observation, the Kindergarten is Readiness Assessment. The, it seems like it was throughout the year, is that? Uh, no, it was within the 40, first 45 days okay. of the kindergarten year, and the legislature and the administration eliminated that okay. uh, in fall of 21. That is no more. That is no more. Right. And, and, if I, and if I could, observations take place uh, informally every day throughout the day. Ms. Hansen is uh, observing her first graders in Lemmer Elementary every day on a regular basis. Um, that doesn't take time away from her job. It's part of her job. Yes, President Albridge. Thank you. So, yeah, to that point, I do remember that conversation, and that was um, very concerning. And what, what I appreciate about these standards is that they are actually getting away from, I think, that conversation that we had, which was pushing academic standards down onto five-year-olds, mm -hmm. which just seemed ridiculous. And so these standards are really play-based mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. education, and I think that's where we wanted to get back to. So that's what I really appreciate about these standards. And I, I think the observations, I mean, that is the way you can modify and, and understand, you know, if children are progressing the way they should be. Um, but they're doing it in a setting where they're, you know, it's, it's play-based and it's interactive and it's, it's not the uh, sit and get that we seemed to be doing for a little while there that was very concerning to a lot of us at this table. I think to that, to that point, there's a, a school of thought to which a number of us subscribe that uh, there should be some measure of unstructured times, unstructured play time mm -hmm. for children um, that uh, creates some interaction uh, between kids, among kids, that you wouldn't otherwise have in structured activities. They bump into one another and they have to navigate those, those bumps. Mm -hmm. um, that may be temporarily unsettling, um, but it also helps for their growth as, as well. Other questions, comments? No. I like what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much.
Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Kaye. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you uh, Mr. Board. Lauer. Thank you for your time. We're now uh, sitting 225, and we're at the report of our board president, Dr. Albrecht. Very, very briefly, I just want to say I hope everyone has had a great summer so far. I want to congratulate all of the Regional Teachers of the Year and welcome Nanette Hansen to the table. We look forward to spending the year with you and learning all about um, your perspective on education. And then also, of course, thank uh, Leah Porter for all of her um, wonderful insights throughout the year, um, which we greatly appreciate. Uh, just a couple of things. Since our last meeting, I was able to sit in on the U.S. Department of Education's presentation on Title IX. Um, it seems, unfortunately, that every time we have a new, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, every time we have a new administration, we seem to have <laughs> all new Title IX regulations. So um, I, I think there's going to be a lot more to come on that. Um, and then I was also able to attend the Education Commission of the States meeting in Washington, D.C. last month. Um, in addition to the semi-annual commissioner meeting, um, which I'm a member of the commission on behalf of the state, along with uh, a few other individuals. Um, we also had the opportunity to sit in on a number of presentations and heard some from some other state superintendents across the country. So it was a very valuable three days in the nation's capital and really appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, the other thing that I was able to do while I was there was uh, finally meet with Paulo Di Maria, who is the relatively new president and CEO of NASB, and we had a great conversation about the direction that they'd like to go and, and what's happening in Michigan. Um, he is from our neighboring state of Ohio, so he's relatively familiar with us, um, and so that was a great opportunity as well. And that is it for me. Thank you, uh, President Albrich. Uh, next report is a report of the state superintendent. I will also like to um, welcome and congratulate uh, Ms. Hansen and her uh, nine Teacher of the Year colleagues. It was a, uh, a joyous bunch this morning. Got us started without caffeine. It was human <laughs> caffeine. Um, I would like to take the opportunity, Board, to share a little bit about the state budget approved by the legislature end of June into early July and signed into law by the governor on July 14th. So I'm going to switch chairs with Jennifer Cook. She's going to become the um, state superintendent. <laughs> 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 I seem overly excited about that. Very Pretty rare that I actually raise a chair. <laughs> okay. Um, board, I'd like to talk with you today about the relationship among the state's top 10 strategic education plan, the state budget uh, approved this early summer, and local budget, student outcomes, and structural balance. As you know, two years ago um, this month, the State Board of Education approved the top 10 strategic education plan with its eight goals, with metrics, the contributions associated with those metrics. These are the eight goals of the top 10 strategic education plan that you approved two years ago this month. And what you notice about these goals is the two resource upstream goals, goal seven and eight, addressing of the teacher shortage and adequate and equitable school funding, respectively, uh, help drive all the downstream goals. Similarly, the two developmental upstream goals, goals one and two, addressing the expansion of early childhood education, the improvement of early literacy, respectively, as well as health, safety, and wellness, goal three, help drive all other downstream goals, goals four, five, and six, secondary school program expansion, high school graduation rate increases, and post-secondary credential rate increases, respectively. The budget that we are talking about is the fiscal year 23 budget, in school parlance, the 22-23 budget. This budget supports all eight goals of the state's top 10 strategic education plan. This is, in many ways, I've described this as a generational budget in support of students and educators. It's an extraordinary and complicated budget in many ways. It is a budget to which we may refer in the future as when we began to pivot in the state. Many of us hearken back to 2011 
as a particularly dark year in the education history of the state. And one could imagine that fiscal year 23, nothing's determined yet, but one can imagine that fiscal year 23 is of a magnitude that it could have an impact to set us on a very different trajectory moving forward. I want to take you through a few of the high points of this budget and the relationship between the budget and the state strategic education plan. So goal eight is the provision of adequate and equitable school funding. And what you see is that this budget increased uh, the per pupil foundation allowance by $450 per child to $9,150 per pupil or a 5.2% increase. Goal eight in Talking about provision of adequate and equitable school funding doesn't just lean on the adequate adjective, it leans on the equitable adjective as well. We know, board, um, and we've talked about this a lot at this table, that different children have different needs, different needs, different costs, and this budget includes another $480.7 million to con continue building a weighted funding model to address the different costs associated with educating students with different needs. This budget includes $246 million, a 15.6% increase for students with disabilities. It's an extraordinary increase. This does not fully fund special education in the state of Michigan, but it begins to walk up closer to that. Uh, for a number of years, we were underfunding special education by between two-thirds and three-quarters of a billion dollars, and this makes a big dent in that, uh, in that underfunding. This budget adds $223 million, a 42.5% increase for economically disadvantaged children, Section 31A funding. This budget adds $10 million, or 26.6% 26 uh, 26 increase in Section 61A CTE program reimbursement. This budget adds $1.3 million, a 5.2% increase for English language learners, so-called Section 41 funding. And this budget adds $438,000, 5.2% for students in rural and isolated districts, so-called Section 22D funding. Still within goal eight, the provision of adequate and equitable school funding, this budget adds $475 million in a school consolidation and infrastructure fund. Or you may recall that the governor recommended $1 billion for this that could be spread over, that would have been spread over a six-year period of time, approximately $167 million a year over six years. The uh, state legislature, in fact, funded this at $475 million, included the notion of school consolidation uh, with it. And there are some parameters associated with this, this funding that at least half of it has to be spent uh, on uh, consolidation. Um, and so it limits what's available for uh, infrastructure and for the, um, the creation of healthier and safer schools. But I will say this, this is one of the tremendous bright spots and new spots in this buzz budget, President Albrecht, that Dr. Pugh has talked about the importance of clean air and clean water. Well, this actually puts money into the state budget specifically um, in the State School Aid Act to address healthier school buildings. And we think there's a tremendous value uh, to this, in addition to the great work that's being done by Eagle on clean air and clean uh, water. Goal seven of the state strategic education plan is uh, the increase in the numbers of certified teachers in areas of shortage. And here again, I think this is a pivot point for the state of Michigan. Two years ago, the state legislature gave us our first dollars for teacher recruitment and retention. Five million dollars, Ms. Hanson. Now, five million dollars sounds like a lot, but three dollars per child doesn't sound like a lot, and that's ish what five million dollars was two years ago. Last year, we got 1.67 million dollars for teacher recruitment and reten retention. Again, it may sound like a lot in your bank account. It doesn't sound like so much when it's spread over 1.4 million public school children. This is $575 million. This is an acknowledgment on the part of the state legislature, not only that we have a teacher shortage, 
but that it, the state legislature, has a responsibility to address that teacher shortage. This budget includes $305 million for the so-called Michigan Future Educator Fellowships, scholarships for young people who aspire to be teachers, $175 million for Grow Your Own programs for support staff to become teachers, $50 million for Michigan Future Educator student teacher stipends. You may recall that the um, department felt very strongly about the need for student teachers um, to be able to be paid while they are teaching. Some people say, well, they're just student teachers. They are just student teachers. But this is no longer a buyer's market for teachers. It's a seller's market for teachers. And if it's a seller's market for teachers, we have the responsibility to more greatly incentivize the creation of teachers. And part of that incentivizing is the uh, making available of uh, student teacher stipends. $20 million to Teach for America, $15 million for troops to teachers, $10 million to ISDs to recruit and hire CTE instructors. $575 million in total. Um, you can see that there's a mix of recurring and non-recurring. Much of this is recurring. $355 million of the $575 million is recurring, at least as, as it's currently constituted at the current time. This is a tremendous acknowledgment on the part of the legislature that we have an issue and that the issue needs to be funded by the legislature. Kudos to the governor and the legislature for their work in this area. And thanks to the department staff and all of those in local school districts and ISDs that advocated for those sorts of solutions that we put forward to the legislature last fall. Goal three of the state strategic education plan is the improvement of health, safety, and wellness of students. This budget adds $245 million in four related categories. And you reflect upon this, Deputy Superintendent Garant. Four years ago, we had precisely nothing in the state school aid act, nothing for uh, student mental health. And it wouldn't be until um, the summer of 18, effective fiscal year 19, that we added $30 million for uh, so-called Section 31N mental health funding. This budget adds $245 million to the funding uh, that was previously um, available to, to school districts last year. Look at um, the constitution of this $245 million, $150 million to districts for discretionary mental health needs. These are per pupil payments to improve mental health, the hiring of staff, the implementing of screening tools, the provision of school personnel with consultations with behavioral health clinicians and other mental health services or products. This is a ginormous increase um, relative to um, the funding that we've had in the past. $45 million increase to the TRAILS program, which was funded for the first time in fiscal year 22. $25 million increase to existing funding for school-based health clinics and $25 million increase in, ex in existing mental health grants to ISDs for mental health professionals and school mental health centers. And then in the same goal, the improvement of health, safety, and wellness of students, goal three, one of those upstream goals, Ms. Hansen, right? We talk about upstream goals because everything else, upstream goals affect everything else downstream, right? So this is, this is a goal that's... Um, focused on health, safety, and wellness. And it's not simply on the mental health side, although it is. It's also on the physical health side, Ms. Garcia, as well. So student safety, an additional $210 million, $168 million to districts for discretionary school safety needs. $150 million of this will be to public schools in a, on a per-pupil basis. $18 million for non-public schools on a per-pupil basis. And you can see the allowable uses there, I won't uh, read those for you, but I think it's really important that people understand that this budget leans into coordination with law enforcement, training on threat assessment, threat response, and crisis communication. To reference um, uh, a comment made earlier by Board Member Snyder, safety infrastructure, uh, infrastructure improvements, and in addition to the professional development that staff need in this, uh, in this area. 
$25 million additionally to hire school safety officers. Some feel the need for school safety officers, some don't, but there'll be $25 million additionally to hire uh, new uh, school safety officers if, uh, if communities uh, wish them. $15 million for cross-system intervention support. And we're gonna be meeting on this uh, soon with uh, uh, the professor from Michigan State, uh, the individual from uh, a national uh, center on this cross-system work where we're looking at um, who gets flagged in community health, who gets flagged um, in local uh, police pr protection, who gets flagged in school districts, and creating mechanisms where they're talking to one another and are, are addressing um, young people who are of concern in a, in a more comprehensive way, in a, in a less siloed fashion. $2 million to create a school safety and mental health commission within the department. We'll be talking about that more in the future. As we, as we pivot, you heard um, Director of Early Childhood Education, Out of School Learning, uh, Richard Lauer, talk about early childhood standards. What you didn't hear him talk about today, uh, but which you would have been uh, delighted to have spoken about, is the expansion of early childhood programming. That early childhood programming um, has been funded additionally $34 million in fiscal year 23, $168 million more for fiscal year 22, $202 million increase over the, the two fiscal years, fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23. This will allow us to increase the number of young people in preschool by more than 20,000 kids annually in the state. You want to talk about a literacy intervention. There's nothing more impactful than starting children early in school, getting them acculturated in school, getting them comfortable with playing with one another, getting young people used to the rhythm of school, getting them used to the relationship among letters and sounds and meaning, the value of, of, of those connections, letting them understand basic numeracy all within a play environment. We're very, very excited about the opportunity to expand uh, preschool in the state of Michigan. We think that there is nothing better as a literacy intervention than the expansion of uh, preschool. Uh, but goal one is also um, benefited. The expansion of early childhood learning opportunities, Dr. Kenneth Schnecht, is also benefited by an increase in early on uh, funding. And this is the second year in a row that the legislature has poured money into early on. And what early on helps us do, board members, is to identify early learning and developmental challenges in children and begin to address those challenges because the earlier we get on it with kids, the better off we're going to be, and more importantly, the better off they're going to be. As we move forward, it's really critical, board, community, that we stay focused on uh, the relationship between recurring revenue and recurring expenditures. Structural balance is uh, the notion that recurring revenue should equal or exceed recurring expenditures and that you ought not to put recurring expenditures on non-recurring revenue. State Budget Office has spent a lot of time reflecting upon what revenue is uh, enduring and uh, upon which one can base on a recurring basis, and what revenue is one time and should only be appropriated um, in a non-recurring fashion. This is really critical. SBO has done some great work in this, uh, in this regard. I might add uh, the governor and the legislature are both focused um, on these con uh, concepts. We certainly are in the, in the State Department of Education. We're tremendously encouraged uh, by this budget. It is a generational budget. It is a generational moment for public schools in the state. Um, I lift up the budget. I thank the governor and the state legislature for their uh, advocacy of and, and passage of and signing into law of this budget. 
and look forward to helping implement it. Be happy to answer any of your questions. Um, it wouldn't be a, uh, a state board presentation without a, um, without a quote. So notwithstanding this terrific budget, um, we still have uh, miles to go before we sleep. And that is from the poem by Robert Frost. The, words, the woods <clears throat> are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before I sleep. Does anybody have any questions? Ms. Listen. Um, thank you for that presentation. You know, I mean, the, the work that went into that budget, and not just the work this year, but I'm talking about the years and years of work of so many education warriors yeah. <laughs> across the state, whether it was parents and students, people in the department, um, people that care about the future of education in the state. We're talking about decades and decades of, of work. Um, and it is extremely encouraging. Um, the question that I have for you is, is really based on something that you said at the end of the presentation, which really does bear heavily on me. Um, you know, having been in the fight for as long as I have in terms of creating a funding formula in the state that reflects the needs of the children um, and really moving away from the initial vision of Proposal A, which to me was sort of a blunt ax in terms of um, uh, quality over equity. Um, the issue of recurring expenditures being paid for with non-recurring dollars, that is something that does weigh on me. Um, and my question is, I know that it's something that the department and, and SBO have given a lot of thought to. What kind of guidance, or can we offer guidance to local districts as they are going through this transformational budget yeah. to be able to, to cope with, with that, given the reality of pressure to spend the money, spend the money, spend the money? Right. I mean, there, there is a, um, there, there certainly um, are pressures to, to spend. But those pressures to spend ought not to extend to spending um, <clears throat> foolishly um, or, or overly quickly. Um, there's an awkwardness associated with some of the uh, federal mm -hmm. funding. The state funding is primarily, not exclusively, but primarily recurring funding. So for example, the foundation allowance the increase in 31A for economically disadvantaged students, the increase for uh, students with disabilities. Those are all, the, the, the increase for English language learners, those are all considered recurring increases. Um, when you look at the money for teacher recruitment, uh, $575 million, the fellowships or scholarships are considered to be recurring. The stipends for student teachers are considered to be recurring. The Grow Your Own programs, at least for now, are considered one time. But the amount of money is sufficient that it will extend over a period of years. So it's a one-time appropriation, but with the ability to use it over a period of years. Okay. The value of that is it acknowledges the finite, finiteness of the resources on the one hand, but doesn't encourage foolish spending overly, overly rash spending. So we, we spend what we're able to in the first year on the Grow Your Own programs. And if we have money in the second and the third year for Grow Your Own programs, that's a good thing. If we can extend it or expand it for a period of, of years, there's a value associated with that. SBO has done a lot of work. I've had um, a great deal of conversation with the, the budget director about this. I've had a, a lot of conversation with 
uh, Deputy Superintendent Garant, with our um, uh, budget, um, our, our director of the Office of Financial Management, uh, Spencer Simmons, about this concept. And to the issue of guidance, so we've put out guidance um, in the past. We are beginning to do the circuit of conferences, and we'll be sharing this message about structural balance with um, the range of professionals as we get out. So for example, next week I'm taping a presentation uh, for the school business officials. This will be a piece of that, that uh, message. When we speak to superintendents in September, this will be a piece of that message. I reached out to have some conversation with uh, Don Watruba at school boards to see that this message was getting out there in, um, in, uh, to his members, and he felt that it, that it was. So it's an important message, and we, we work to, to get it out there in a variety of fashions. Yeah, thank you. And thank you also for um, hearkening back to the history. The, um, the study that was funded uh, in the lame duck session of 2014 started a series of studies on school funding in the state and exposed what many of us who were wrestling with that underfunding for years knew, um, that our kids were being cheated and they weren't being, uh, their education wasn't being funded to the level that it needed to be. And that first funded study, which would ultimately be uh, accomplished or effectuated in 2016, the second study that would be finished, the first that would be funded, the second that would be finished, um, led us um, in a series of studies that, that peeled the funding issues back in a variety of different ways and looked at it from a whole host of different ways. And one of the, one of the things I like to cite was that uh, one of those studies was, was led by uh, the former lieutenant governor. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Calley, who exposed that we were underfunding special education in the state by three quarters of a billion dollars. So, um, you know, this isn't a partisan uh, perspective. This is pretty, pretty dispassionate. Yeah, thank you. Um, other, other reflections? Um, if oh. not, we can, we can uh, do a coffee break. Oh. Coffee break. No, no. Our next break should be I'm sorry. Break I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, the next I'm sorry. break we a, get should be. I, I should not have yelled squirrel in the midst of a board meeting. <laughs> Dr. Pugh, to you. Um, and there, you know, we're not where we eventually will get to, but there definitely is a lot to celebrate here. And so i um, excited, and, and as much as I can talk about it, um, I am doing that as well as what the department did to do the education and a lot of the groundwork to um, make sure <clears throat> folks across the state know the needs of our children um, in our school district. So a lot, I mean, it definitely is to be commended. Um, and my mine is a question. I realize that I don't, maybe I don't necessarily know what we mean by consolidation. So yeah. just wanted to get some insight on, on that. Sure. So you may recall that... Um, uh, about 12 years ago, 11 years ago, um, the uh, former Governor Snyder um, pushed the notion of consolidation. He felt, many of us felt, I believe, that we have too many school districts in the state. And there, there's nothing that requires this number of young people to have 835 LEAs. In the, in the state. He felt that there could be some value to consolidation. Consolidation is more complicated than it appears at first blush. The, the, the fact that you don't have a lot of children in a district doesn't mean that that district should necessarily be consolidated by a neighboring district. If you're in a relatively populated corner of the state, perhaps yes. If you're the only district in that, um, in that particular um, area, then no. Uh, you're it. Uh, in the absence of that, there is no public education in, in that corner of the, the state. Um, there were some consolidations that came of that moment. There were not many that came of the moment, as you, you may recall. And I think this is an effort on the part of some in the legislature to re-engage in that conversation and to perhaps incentivize it 
in a better way. One of the one of the arguments. Um, let me back up. There was a feeling back um, when the first effort to consolidate in recent memory took place in 2011. There was a feeling that there wasn't a lot of money to help incentivize local school districts to come together. And so this is in some ways a testing of a hypothesis. If there's greater incentivizing, might you get a, a greater amount of consolidating and, and, and a more efficient system of public education in the state? It's an interesting test. We'll see. Um, there, there are a lot of districts that um, th they like their, their local history, they like their local control, they like their local mascot, they like their local high school, and, 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 and they're not prepared to give it up um, easily, and they're not prepared to give it up if they don't, if they're not really uh, pushed financially to, to do it. At the time, um, the finances were tight in the state, and incentives were minimal. Right now, finances are not as tight in the state, and incentives are greater. Will that mean more takers for consolidation or not? I don't know, but we're about to find out. And so and just another question. I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but because um, I don't think um, that within districts, there are folks who don't think that there needs to be consolidation. So when we talk about consolidation, we're talking about across districts. So this yes, funding would never be used for within a district, that 50 percent. So it's my understanding that it is cross district. Oh, okay. Okay. But, but you know what? The, um, it's a really good question. And one could argue, I would argue, <clears throat> pardon me, that there are efficiencies to be had both cross district and within district. And um, that might be an interesting amendment <coughs> to state statute okay. that we could consider. Yeah, I think that there's some, some value to that. Current statute, though, is talking solely about cross-district consolidation. It's Ypsilanti Willow Run, right. for example. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is, in, in a fashion, um, consolidation around um, the dissolution of Buena Vista. Right. Um, and the and the cutting up of that in in, in as you as you re remember into to three other um, districts. Mm -hmm. So um, so I think that's really what was intended. But I can think of an example, which is perhaps the same example to which you're thinking, that uh, or of which you're thinking, where a little bit of money could help create consolidation within a district and could create a more efficient district mm -hmm. with more dollars going into um, classroom instruction right. and less money being spent to limp along um, with outdated facilities. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a really good point. We ought, to, um, we ought to have some more conversation on that. Thank you. Um, mas preguntas, more questions. Nope, hearing and seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Simmons, for being with us today. Uh, Mr. Garant, are there board members who wish to offer comments? So, um, as you already know, but I wanted to inform the board. Um, for years, I have been um, working <coughs> to support a group at Park West Foundation, they work with youth that have aged out of the system. And I was um, approached earlier this year by Saba, who works at Park West Foundation with the youth. And she was informing me about an issue with the foster youth um, when it comes to education. So, you know, a lot of the foster youth end up in residential facilities, and it's for different reasons. One of the um, reasons that have come up recently with COVID is some, there are youth where um, both of their parents have passed from COVID. Um, 
and and it's different different reasons state law though um has it where residential facilities can offer educational um, options for the students so they can take classes high school classes there the problem mm -hmm. is the classes are not accredited mm -hmm. and a lot of times the students don't know the residential facilities don't inform them um, and then a year two years later they go to high school thinking they've done a year or two or more mm -hmm. and they find out that those credits do not transfer so that's a huge issue and then those students are in high school and they have to do all of those years over again and I'm so proud of the group that she works with because I know that could be so discouraging where we could lose a lot of students where they could say we're, we're not gonna do this you know and they could just drop out so but a lot of these students have pushed on I, I, um, I called Dr. Rice about it. Um, he was very helpful and insightful. He contacted Kyle Garant, who has been joining the meetings we've been having. I asked Kyle to also invite MDHHS to be at the table, and they have. So in a future, in the near future, I would like um, Saba, you know, from Park West Foundation, and the students to come present to you guys and give their t testimonies as well as have Kyle and um, MDHHS present about what they're doing to try to help with this issue um, the best that we can because again, state law is, is the issue. Just wanted you guys to be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sully. Um, other, uh, other board members, other board members, Ms. Lipton and Mr. McMillan. Um, so I would um, just like to let all of you know that um, on September 22nd, um, the Women's Official Network Foundation is going to be honoring um, Kathy Strout, who many of you know, uh, longtime president of this body. Uh, she is, memory serves me, approaching the 100th birthday. I believe that she will be 99 um, at the time of the <coughs> banquet. Um, and um, I'm the, uh, the banquet chair this year, and I assured her, assured her that she is well-loved and remembered, and I know that we would like a wonderful turnout <laughs> of uh, supporters from the education community. Um, so if any of you wish to here and uh, appreciating uh, Ms. Kathy Strauss's uh, wonderful work as an education advocate and president of the state board. Um, the event is going to be held in Southfield on September 22nd at 5.30. The tickets um, are on the website of the Women's Official Network Foundation. Thank you. Good news. Um, Kathy Strauss was on this board for 24 years. And um, anybody who endures for 24 years <laughs> certainly deserves an, an award. And she didn't simply endure. She, um, she survived. She thrived. She led. Um, she was a force. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Other board members, we're at uh, Mr. McMillan, Dr. Pugh. Yeah, I was um, looking more. I didn't, you know, it's 139 pages. So I just looked briefly a little bit more about the early childhood standards and I'm um, obviously not going to rehash it, just to say that I'm, you know, looking on page 29, I'm concerned about, you know, it seems like there's an interest to start segregating kids, uh, identifying themselves as being part of various groups, uh, racial, cultural, and then, you know, I know that's a precursor to getting them to identify which ones are the oppressed and which ones are the oppressors, and it, uh, so five-year-olds are doing that, and they're going to be put into groups of gender identities. So I don't know if that means I'd like to know. Maybe somebody can email me who developed these, but does that mean that little boys need to say, well, you only identify as a boy right now, but a five-year-old boy might identify as a girl, and uh, already introducing that because it's in the standards about gender identities. So I um, just thought I should, I'd be remiss to not at least mention that as I saw it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't think that there's um, a um, an interest in or a, uh, a, a, a 
a direction toward segregation okay. in the Are we going to uh, debate? Standards. You want to go back and forth? Or? I'd be happy to. I'm like not to, sure uh, you would like to. You just like to talk to, over me every time. All right. Thanks. I, I, uh, occasionally footnote you. Yeah. Um, other board members, Dr. Pugh. Um, somewhat to uh, board member Tilly's point when she was talking about the foster uh, parents and I, another issue that I've also, that I just recently raised with you. Um, and I, I had the opportunity to meet with some women who were um, incarcerated um, actually in the Benton Harbor area. And one of the questions that they raised, um, eat, most of them, I think it was about 10 women that were there and uh, I believe that all of them were parents and all of them raised the issue of, well, there were a few who had lost custody, but there, there were a few who continue to have custody, who have custody of their children, but are in the criminal justice system and were having concerns with not knowing um, the status of their children's, um, their, their education. Uh, was a, a major concern um, of theirs as it related to the education system. And so, um, you know, thank you, Dr. Rice. I will send that information. I did ask for more information, uh, but send that over to you. But uh, being able to have that conversation with them um, and hear some of their concerns around the education system, as well as having conversations with them in general, um, about Michigan's education system. Um, it was a good conversation um, and hoping that we can help them in, in some sort of way. Um, I mentioned that um, NASB is uh, be starting, has just initiated a justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, committee, and I'm honored to be able to serve as the chair of, of that committee. So um, we'll, we'll have our first meeting coming up sometime this month. And so I will make sure everyone is aware of that, but it's really more of an internal look at NASB and then making sure that from um, the board itself to the staffing that we're uh, addressing justice, equity, diversity, diversity and inclusion. Um, and it, it reminds me too, there was another question that I had when we were doing our equity, diverse, diversity and inclusion and along the lines of the internal checks is looking at contracts and procurement. Um, and I see these things as, you know, how do we service children and family, you know, making sure that we have our, ourselves uh, fully together so that we can do that. And then when we look at um, contracts and procurement, are we also looking at that as a way to make sure that we're best servicing um, our children. Even when we were talking about the consultants with the early childhood development, are we looking at diversity when, when we look at our contracts, consultants, contractors, what have you? So another thought that I had a question. Um, and then I just really want to, moving on is just, um, um, just ditto what our president said and welcome you, Ms. Hansen. We are so happy to have you. I did get a chance to hear your, your introduction. So just excited about the work that you want to do. And, and yes, and we say this every time, but yes, Leah definitely left huge <laughs> shoes for you to fill. Um, so, but I know that you're up to it and uh, was really um, inspired by what you said and, and can't wait to learn from you. So thank you uh, for, for joining us and to all of your uh, fellow um, and regional uh, Teachers of the Year, just congrats. So I think that that's it. And, and just email presentation, if we could get the DEI presentation and definitely the budget. A presentation. I don't know if we got that emailed. Do, we, do so. we distribute budget presentations? I thought it. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. I'm looking at hard copy. Yeah. yeah the hard copy. Oh, you wanted to see the, the electronic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I we want to be able to use yep. that. Yep. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Pritchard. Thank you. Um, I echo the welcome to Nanette. Uh, we already are fast and true friends because we're both Ubers. So when you all are concerned about snow, we'll tell you about what snow really is. So um, I also, uh, from this morning, want to thank um, all the pre presenters, but in particular the partnership districts presentation 
um, Tom, you are right um, as we the board looks at that, and I appreciate the fact that you ask, you know, what have we learned over the years? Because there has been improvement. Um, I was involved in some of those first partnership agreements, uh, and um, just by listening, I have heard the improvements. Um, but I am so pleased that this board uh, took the step forward in 2017 and said we are not going to have as a goal to close schools, but instead have as a goal um, to recognize the possibilities of these schools who are facing absolutely immense challenges um, across the board. And they continue to face those challenges, though this new budget is certainly going to assist in that area. There are still so many other challenges that they um, face that I appreciate the department's support as they move forward. Um, and then um, to our school districts across the state, um, we wish you a uh, positive start to the 2022-23 school year. We have all come miles in these last couple of years but in particular, our schools have our teachers, our administrators, and most especially our students and families. And we've got challenges still ahead, but I do believe firmly that this year will look certainly different from last year, uh, and we will be able to move ahead. The challenges ahead are we continue to read about the shortage of teachers, the shortage of staff. Um, and that is of a concern because uh, while this may be August, whatever today's date is, the 8th or 9th, um, and those of us who have been in schools in August, school starts tomorrow. Uh, and if you don't have staff in place, um, you're scurrying around trying to figure out where do we go from here and what am I going to do the first day of school when children are at the door. So, um, but um, everyone will rise to the occasion, I'm sure. Um, I will review again, I just glanced at the early childhood standards. My initial reaction to them was these are observable behaviors that we may or may not see in children, right. and that's okay. Um, we may see um, uh, a behavior of a child who stomps his foot, um, when he's three or four or five and says, I'm mad, or we may not see that, we may see another behavior. Um, so that's the way, at least my initial impression was, but I am going to research that and look forward to the public comment. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pritchett. The, they, they are observable standards, and what we know is, is that children's behavior um, at any age of development lies on a continuum. Um, and to Dr. Kennigschneck's um, comment during the presentation or during the Q&A, some children never climb a rock wall um, and shouldn't be expected to climb a rock wall. Um, others climb uh, more, uh, more quickly or earlier in their lives and, and some, some later. Um, it really is just a, a what can you expect um, of young people in their in their development. So I appreciate you um, sharing that. Board future meetings are September 13th, October 11th, November 15th, December 13th, all Tuesdays, all at 9.30 a.m., all regular meetings, all the second Tuesday of the month with the exception of November, which will be the third Tuesday of the month because the second Tuesday of the month is the election. If there are any topics board members would like included in future meeting agendas, please notify uh, Ms. Marilyn Merch Schneider or me. Let the record show that it is now 314. Enjoy your additional 46 minutes. Have a good day.